video games. Today it's become synonymous with what you would call the geek internet culture. But what you may not understand is what it means to a lot of different people. To me, video games are about creating interactive stories. No matter what, you look through history, everything is about telling a story. Depending on how, how that story changed your perception, you're going to go tell your friend and then you're going to share that experience. And, um, and, I, and that's what I love about video games and I think that's what it really does. Video games, yeah, it's like a childhood dream realized. It, it's opened up so many doors for me. You know, like I've made so many friends, worked on so many different things that I never thought I would have been able to because it opened up that revenue for me. It means a minor legacy, you know, because when I finally retire, I could say that, you know, I've had a couple ship games. From its humble beginnings as a children's toy, video games have evolved into one of the biggest entertainment industries in the world, with its captivating stories, charming characters, and immersive worlds. However, as it becomes more complex and sophisticated, there is a higher demand for financial returns, and with it comes a controversial subject matter that I will investigate. The subject matter of DLC. Round one, fight! Um, the uh, fondest memory was Street Fighter in the arcades. So it was like uh, me and my brother would go down there and we'd play and then, you know, there'd be random people that would try to, you know, like, um, you know, they, they all tried to challenge each other and it was fun. One time I had like a four kid killing streak, you know, so it was so fun. Yeah, <laughs> it's all right, you know. <laughs> I had a 2600, but it wasn't a 2600 at the time. It was a VCS when I had it. So I played Adventure, I liked Demon Attack. Oh, com no, not combat. Nobody liked combat. My name is Ching Lau. I am an environment artist at Zenimax Online Studios. Anything that, you know, you see in game, if it's part of the environment, like if it's a building or if it's a simple prop, like, you know, I might have had a hand in that. I'm Gabriel Pendleton, and uh, I do a couple things. Uh, I run BaltimoreGamer.com, which is my most recent project, um, and I've been doing that for four and a half years, um, documenting the video games and geek culture scene of Baltimore. And when I'm not doing that, I'm a game developer. Also, I run a two-man studio with a friend called Ryzen Studios. So, um, you know, we're working on some projects now that we have, but uh, that's, that's what I do. A lot of the classes that I teach are computer animation classes because um, if you're going to be an artist on a video game project, a lot of the time you need computer animation, and I'm one of the two people in the department that can teach those classes, so I get to. downloadable content um, so <laughs> it's a way for companies like uh, to add extra or new content in um, video games after the sale so like uh, a lot of the times it's like you know downloadable content might be new missions or might be new skins or you know it might be a new character there are different types, um, so you can go to say like in-app purchases DLC. You can say um, disc lock, um, which you know comes already on the disc. Is just you know unlock at a certain point or when they decide that they want to allow that content to be available to the player. I think initially they just wanted be to be able to fix bugs. They wanted to be able to, you know, if some or if somebody, you know, hacked their game, and um, what, you know, it was the way of getting updates. I think is a extra way for companies to make money off, you know, for already existing um, IP. So how do you do that? How do you keep the player coming back? How do you keep the player wanting to, you know, we, you want that loyal player to keep buying your games, to keep putting money into it somehow. Because of downloadable content, a game is, has the potential of never really being done. 
you know, if you're a fan of a game, that means that you'll be finding new, you know, new stories for characters that you've grown to like, you know. So, I mean, why not? <laughs> You know, Call of Duty, Call of Duty, um, you know, Activision, I know it's changed hands for a while, but I would say they use it uh, very well just in terms of extending the life of their game. Um, in terms of a map packs, uh, like weapons, gear, um, stuff like that. Like, um, I, I played the game very early in the series when it came out. So I don't play too much of it now, you know, kind of got mainstream, really mainstream now. My son really likes Castle Crashers and he played through the whole game and, you know, and the game was like 10 bucks. He got like four characters and 30 weapons, but then they had like seven or eight different other downloadable content packs for Castle Crashers. And they're like two bucks each, and I bought half of them, and they, you know, it doubled the amount of time that he got to play that game. So, you know, done right, you know, it's just a way of adding a little bit more fun stuff after, you know, after the initial release. There definitely are companies that can see the profit in DLC. So they will definitely, you know, put that in kind of their strategy. I don't know if it's kind of exploitive to use it in that way, but I mean, in terms of using it badly, um, I would say one of the biggest examples um, was Mass Effect. The ending was not that great at all. So a lot of people were upset because they felt the game was rushed. They didn't take enough time to finish it. They just they rushed it out because they knew that they were going to have like some downloadable content coming after the fact. And so there was a whole, you know, back and forth with the community versus, you know, the developers and, and, and the publishers of, of Mass Effect. And then you had the downloadable, you know, that was like, hey, now we got a better ending, you know, and... <laughs> Well, you know, they, they sent out a story, they should have stuck with their guns, but, you know, they decided that, you know, with all the fans being angry about it, they kind of decided, it's like, okay, let's fix it and make everybody happy. But, you know, it's, they didn't, they shouldn't have done that, but it set the precedence. <laughs> I think the core of the whole problem is transparency. Companies need to be more open with their customers. If they, you know, through the process, they're saying, hey, we might, you know, offer some of these features later or something like that because this is kind of how we see the vision of the product, right? And this is why we don't. If more companies had that conversation, you wouldn't have that issue. But because companies, you know, especially in the Mass Effect case, where that happened and like why they did that like no one knew um it kind of felt like you know we were getting cheated like you know you already did the work this was already included for it and we we're paying you know our 60 bucks so you know whatever for this game like why you know why would you take that piece out that was obviously already there sometimes it's just like a money grab you know, that, that's one of those cases where it should have been free or it should have been like, you should have been able to unlock it without having to buy it. But you know, it's a, uh, it's, uh, I guess it's an okay practice now. I mean, on, on one side, it's not cool because you paid for the game. You know, it's already on the disc. Well, on the other side, it's like, you know, uh, from the developer's point of view, any time that you could put a little more money in the pocket means that, you know, somebody's going to be working a little longer, you know? So I can't argue against that, even though it's not the cleanest way to do things, you know? Again, if you had that transparency there, uh, there players would be a, a lot more forgiving if, if it, everything was like in open conversation. For games nowadays, success can be primarily is only measured in how much, you know, how much profit it makes back. Games cost so much to make now, so it's how can we close that gap on production costs. Um, so it can feel like to the player that companies are definitely trying to get every dollar out of you, but you also have to recognize that 
this is the demand that players have now. We want better graphics, actors, you know, coming in video games and speaking for the characters and doing dialogue. We want, you know, cut scenes that are, you know, pretty much could be in any Pixar movie or anything like that. So if we want all those things, you know, that money and, and time, time that's put into it, like it has to be made back somehow. And fortunately for Grand Theft Auto, they did around a billion dollars in sales and hit that mark, you know, pretty, <laughs> pretty quickly. But for companies, um, that aren't Grand Theft Auto is how do they make up their money gap. So that's when you see downloadable content, extra map, extra characters, you know, download this, download that. And so that's why you see a lot of sequels and stuff now because the data shows that if I release a sequel and I know the first one did really well, I'll release the second one and it'll do, it'll, it'll make some guaranteed money. So, you know, it forces bigger companies to take less risks produce more sequels and that's why you have uh, the rise of uh, indie games and stuff like that now. Mm -hmm. Oh, it's here to stay. Um, if for no other reason than people, than that people need ways to uh, fix bugs. You'll always see it. It'll, it'll it's already popular now, it will continue to be popular. You might even see other companies doing what Capcom did and having it like, you know, um, like gates for it. You know? Mainly indie games and DLC, I definitely see a lot more of it. Um, a lot more downloadable content, a lot more in-app purchases, um, because you have to look where the, the market is right now. Between the PS4 and the Xbox One, I like a PS4, the hardware's stronger, you know. Xbox One got a lot of stuff for casual, you know, uh, players, and they got a lot of stuff where, you know, it kind of connects the multimedia, it just, it, or it's easier to connect multimedia. You see the great games that are coming out of, you know, the indie space right now, but PlayStation realized that if we're to survive for the next 10 years, however this next cycle will last, we have to give indie gamers a platform to publish their games. And I think they've done the best job of integrating indie gamers and their platform. I don't know if it can be regulated. Why would they want to regulate it? Because it's bringing in additional revenue. You know, I mean, as long as people buy it, I don't see that happening anytime soon. You know, I mean. It's honestly left up to the players. I mean, the players, they if they feel a company is exploiting the DLC, they can not go out and buy the game. I mean, to be honest, you know, for instance, you know, this particular company is continuously doing this, but people still go out and buy their game, then, you know, you're going to be kind of, you know, you're kind of helping them, you know, continue that process because at the end of the day, you're not really being the voice if you're still going out and buying the game. Yeah, until the day where people stop supporting that, you know, like outright boycotting something, it won't really stop it, you know? It's just the nature of the business. So, it's kind of pessimistic, but it's true.